Aloha mai kako. You are watching Hawaii Political Reporter. Hello, welcome to another edition of the debate. I'm Kavitakli. On the crisis in Ukraine, the country has a new president and prime minister. This is while Viktor Yanukovych has said he was still president of Ukraine. But the crisis in that country is far from over, especially in the Crimea region, home to Russia's Navy fleet. Pro-Moscow gunmen seize control of the parliament and government headquarters. Meanwhile, Russia's military exercises involving some 150,000 troops has drawn a warning reaction from the U.S. to act cautiously, not to take any action on Ukraine that could be misinterpreted. How far will Russia's President Vladimir Putin go to keep Ukraine? Is there a war looming on the horizon? Is the Ukraine crisis reigniting the Cold War tensions and rivalry? Ukraine in uncharted waters as the swiftly unfolding events there continue to make waves. Tensions are simmering high, particularly in the country's southern Crimea region. On Wednesday, thousands of ethnic Russians demonstrated for independence there before being confronted by rival protesters supporting new authorities in Kiev. In the Crimea, you have a different ball game. Uh, the region has an ethnic Russian majority. Um, it's an autonomous republic. It's recently added to Soviet Ukraine, then Ukraine. And there's obviously a very active Tatar minority, which detests ethnic Russians because um, half of the Tatar population was killed on the way to Siberia in 1944. Um, and so the, the tensions are high there. The conflict in the largely pro-Russian autonomous region reached its climax on Thursday after armed men seized government and parliament headquarters in the regional capital, Simferopol, and raised Russian flags over the buildings. The seizure sparked immediate warning from the interim leader in Ukraine that any troops movements at Russia's Black Sea fleet based in Crimea would be seen as a military aggression. Meanwhile, Russia has launched large-scale military drills involving most units in central and western regions of the country. Russia's defense ministry has also announced that fighter jets along its western frontier have been put on combat alert while constantly patrolling the airspace over border districts. Washington was quick to react. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel urged Moscow to be cautious about its military exercises so that they're not misinterpreted. I expect Russia to be transparent about these activities, and I urge them not to take any steps that could be misinterpreted or lead to miscalculation during a very delicate time. With Russia and the West pursuing widely conflicting interests in Ukraine, the world is watching where the volatile situation there is headed. Let me introduce our guest for this edition of the debate, Ukrainian nationalist Katrin Fedorova joins us from Kiev and from the Executive Intelligence Review, Edward Spanaus joins us from Washington. I'd like to welcome both of our guests. Catherine Fedorov, let me start with you. What would you call what has happened in Ukraine? Because some are calling it a coup. Um, thanks for having me. I want to say that finally our people are starting to stand up against corruption and against our leaders who have been stealing money for such a long period of time. That's what I want to call this. That this is actually our way of saying that we need to preserve ourselves as a country, as an independent country, our culture, our heritage, and nation. Okay, you call independence there, there as an adjective. Edward Spanaus, uh, let's uh, go with that line, uh, and I'd like to find out uh, from you uh, the reaction you have on this new interim prime minister, also the president uh, that has been elected, announced in parliament, yet you have the old president, Viktor Yanukovych, who said he is still the president of Ukraine and has given a warning that it's illegitimate rulers, that people in the southeastern and southern regions would never accept mob rule. This is a coup. This is a Western-sponsored coup, particularly the British, NATO, and the United States. No question about it, this was not a peaceful revolution. This was a violent a terrorist action armed guerrillas taking over government buildings. This would never be tolerated in the United States or in Britain or in Germany. Uh, but these countries are backing what has become a neo-Nazi coup and which is taking us to the verge 
of a nuclear confrontation with Russia. Catherine Fedorov, you heard our guest there in Washington. What do you think? Um, it, um, I definitely do disagree with that. I do agree with the part that maybe this revolution was um, is sponsored. Of course, it's sponsored. In the beginning, it was a fake revolution. But later on, when our protests were peaceful in the very beginning, because I even was there, I was there. I saw this with my own eyes how this all turned into a violent revolution. Uh, Yanukovych basically paid our police to remove the protests by force because he didn't want to join the EU or sign an agreement with the EU. And he paid money to beat up elderly people, men, women, children. As you can see, many have died. Hundreds have died from this. And they were all peaceful from the very beginning. And then when he paid the, our police to beat up our people, nationalists stood up and this became a true nationalist revolution. Some people can claim it's a Nazi revolution, national socialist, whatever you want to call it, but it is a national revolution. It is a national, it's not a national socialist, Nazi. We just want to, we just want a bright future for our children and we want our country, we don't want police to beat up their own people in our country. Who wants that? I mean, everybody thinks that there's two options, to join the EU or to join Russia. No, there's a third option about remaining as the country Ukraine, and people need to realize that the option exists, and we need to stick with this option. Do you realize what's going to happen when you have the IMF, uh, who's going to be in talks now and has been in talks with the uh, new officials there, Catherine Fedorov, what type of uh, strings are going to be attached to a possible loan? that's going to be given to Ukraine, do you realize those strengths and how it's going to control your country politically in some ways? I think uh, we can pick whatever leader we want, but our spirit is supposed to be the leader of our nation. That's what I believe in. Edward Spanos, let's, uh, I'm sorry to jump in. Let's move on to this warning by the U.S. Uh, to Russia. Russia must be transparent about its military exercises along Ukraine's border. And of course, those exercises are huge, 150,000 troops as one example, and not take any steps that could be misinterpreted or lead to miscalculation. Tell us what he means when he says misinterpreted or lead to miscalculation. Um, no, I, this is for Edward is Spanos. For I'm sorry. Go ahead, Edward Spanos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the U that this, is, this is true hypocrisy. The United this is as if... What we're looking at is a Cuba Missile Crisis in reverse. Uh, this, is, this represents an expansion, not just of the European Union, but of NATO, right up to Russia's borders. And I think Russia has been quite restrained in their response to this, perhaps because of the, the Sochi Olympics. But this has been something that's been brewing for a long time. The association agreement would not just destroy Ukraine economically, it destroys its economic sovereignty, its political sovereignty, and it brings it into a defense union with Europe. And of course Russia's reacting. This was the intention, was to get Russia to react. Well, I'm not so sure what you mean by restraint. Uh, these are probably one of the biggest uh, exercises, uh, militarily speaking, that Russia is having, Edward Spanos. And I'm reading here, and I wasn't aware that uh, on Tuesday, in the Crimean city of Sevastopol, you have armored personnel carrier and two trucks full of Russian troops who made their appearances there on the streets. So they are showing themselves up, aren't they? Yes, this is within the past two days. You've had a neo-Nazi coup underway since the beginning of December, and Russia did not respond. You've got Svoboda, you've got the right, uh, the right uh, faction there, this right sector, these two groups are the driving force behind the demonstration. I'm not saying everybody in the demonstration is a neo-Nazi, but the neo-Nazis are the ones who are armed, who have been leading the violence against the government authorities, against policemen, and the takeover of regional parliaments and the RADA. The driving force has been Svoboda. This is a neo-Nazi party. And of course Russia is going to react. I'm surprised they didn't react much sooner. Yes, some are deducting that too. Catherine Fedorov, I see you smiling there. Uh, I assume you have a reaction to him. Um, of course I have a reaction because I have been hearing this for 
several of months that people are calling this a neo-Nazi thing. Most people don't realize how people live here because no, it's easy to judge us and our actions while you're living in another country and you don't have to deal with this sort of corruption. That's the whole point. Excuse me, if you're going to be an elderly person who outlived the war, who outlived the whole of the war, and you have a pe you have a pension of around $120 per month, I, I think you would care. I think you would actually be against the government. Who wouldn't be? And we weren't the one who started the violence. People need to realize we were peace first. And another thing people need to realize that the pro-European Union protests, they weren't to be honest, a pro-European protest. They were anti-Russia, because Russia still, to this day, has a huge influence and control over our country and people. And that's why people are against Russia. And you can see by uh, the people's, uh, how people have been basically taking down Lenin monuments as an example that this is more of an anti-Russia thing. The only, the only reason people want to join the European Union because they think that it's going to be better if they join the Union. They think it economically, we are going to be better, and maybe to some certain extent we could be better, but the European Union would be a cultural downfall for us. Well, Edward Spanos, let's talk more about the Crimea developments, and uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, what's happening within that region, and that's uh, the uh, protests that have taken place, and the most recent one of significance is the pro-Moscow gunmen who have seized control of the parliament and also of the government headquarters in the capital uh, and they've raised the Russian flags. Now, do you think that there's going to be uh, a separation in the works there due to the tensions that exist between uh, mostly the, the Russian uh, nationals there and of course the Tartars, uh, as we understand? Well, of course it's a very dangerous situation, but as I said, you can't look at just the past two days in here. You've had a, a neo-Nazi group, the Svoboda, and the right sector who have been the driving force behind these demonstrations. Russia, I mean, Ukraine, after all, was part of Russia for a thousand years. This is not, Russia is not some outside force coming in. The real interference has been from the West, going back to the Orange Revolution and up to today. New video footage has emerged from the eastern Ukrainian city of Donetsk, which purports to show U.S. private mercenaries running through the city center. Videos uploaded online on Friday show men dressed in U.S. style military outfits running through the, spitty, the, through the Russian speaking city with guns and bulletproof body gear. The video also show the men being chased by the residents with locals shouting Blackwater. That's the name of the U.S. mercenary company based in Virginia. One Russian diplomat in Kiev said that 300 employees of private security companies had arrived in the country. Donetsk was the scene of unrest this week as pro-Russian residents seized control of the regional administration headquarters. People in Ukraine's autonomous region of Crimea have once again taken to the streets to express support for a bid to join Russia. Pro-Russia rallies were held in the capital Simferopol and the city of Donetsk to support Crimea's succession bid. Elsewhere in Sevastopol, pro-Russian protesters clashed with supporters of Ukraine's new government. Tensions are running high with Ukraine as Crimean lawmakers have voted in favor of joining neighboring Russia. The residents of the autonomous region are due to hold a referendum on the issue in the coming days. Kiev, however, is outraged over the plan, calling the vote unconstitutional and illegitimate. But one only needs to look at things a little more deeply to see Russia in Crimea is not an act of war like the U.S. in Iraq or the U.S. attack on Syria. Speaking as a person whose core belief is anti-imperialism, I'm here not to defend but to explain how Russia's actions are vastly different to the U.S. actions in Iraq, Libya and Syria. Russia got the permission of the Crimean government and people first, and hence not a bullet has been fired. Russia has had a military presence in Crimea for a decade, as it is covered under a pre-existing treaty where it is allowed to keep military bases there. It is as much an illegal invasion or occupation of Crimea as are U.S. bases in Australia, which they are not. The government of Crimea, which is an autonomous region, requested Russia's presence. Meanwhile, the interim government of Ukraine, 
refusing Russia's presence, is not internationally recognized and has not been elected by the Ukrainian people. Arguably, Yanukovych is still the president of Ukraine and has formally requested the Russian presence, which is what Russia brought up in the United Nations, and hence Russia has not acted against international law. This was not the case when the US invaded Iraq, which was not only an act of aggression, but also an illegal one. Not to mention, funding terrorists in other people's countries is also against international law. Not only did Russia have the permission of the government, but also of the Crimean people, since Crimea was formerly part of Russia as late as 1954, and was given as a gift to Ukraine by Russia during the time that they were all part of the USSR. But the majority of people in Crimea are still Russian, and they have wanted reunification with Russia ever since the fall of the USSR. Now contrast this with the number of Americans who live in and are a part of the landscape of Iraq, Libya and Syria. None. Besides all this, Ukraine borders Russia and hence directly affects Russia. Which of the countries Iraq, Libya and Syria border the US? None. Since Russia has the permission and support of the Crimean people and government in this so-called incredible act of aggression as Kerry called it, not a shot was fired, not a town was bombed, and not a soul was killed. Perhaps that is what Kerry meant when he said, you don't behave this way in the 21st century. He meant that Russia hasn't lived up to the 21st century US standard practices of obliterating nations and bringing them back to the Stone Age. Perhaps if Russia had decimated Crimean cities, poisoned its generations with depleted uranium, and raped and tortured children in front of their parents, as was done in Abu Ghraib, they would be more up to Kerry's standards. Another off-the-charts hypocrisy on the part of Kerry is his saying, you don't just invade nations on trumped-up pretexts. Do the WMDs in Iraq and Syria come to mind? As for Russia's pretext about protecting Russians in Crimea of an impending threat of mass slaughter, they're not very convincing. It's obviously not as simplistic as that. Russia is protecting its lifeline to the Black Sea, so its fleets can have access to the Mediterranean. It was an inevitable consequence of the US's aggressive overthrow of a pro-Russian government in a former Soviet Union state. The first act of the Ukrainian interim government, handpicked by Victoria Noland, was to no longer recognize Russian as an official language of Ukraine and Russian-speaking Ukrainians make up a large part of Ukraine. By disenfranchising and alienating a large segment of Ukrainian society, what did they think was going to happen but instability? Crimeans will soon vote on whether they want to rejoin the Russian Federation. I believe separatism is a kind of treason, but in this case it is not separatism but reunification and not so black and white. To mention again, Ukraine's instability was quite predictable. As I said in my last video, Ukraine will be balkanized. It may not appear so, but annexing Crimea was not Russia's plan A, but in fact plan B. Since after the US-backed coup, Russia will no longer have influence over West Ukraine. The US State Department doesn't really care if Ukraine is balkanized, as highlighted by the fact that Obama did a very bad job of paying lip service to Ukraine in his national address on Crimea. So much so that one Ukrainian tweet said he regretted supporting Maidan after Obama's speech. Too little too late, they realized neither NATO nor the US will risk much to back the new Ukrainian regime against Russia. Nor does the US State Department care about the EU. The EU doesn't have the money to pay off Ukraine's debts, which is highlighted by Germany's foot dragging. This will lead to austerity in Ukraine. But in Victoria Nolan's words, F the EU. All they are really interested in is putting a missile defense shield in West Ukraine and further isolating Russia. A missile defense shield will tip the balance of power such that mutually assured destruction is no longer a problem. And that is a frightening thought for the future of the world. Both Ukraine and the EU have acted against their own interests on the US State Department's promises and threats. East Ukraine and Crimea are the most resource-rich areas in Ukraine. Why would you willingly alienate the parts of society 
living in the most viable land. The crisis in Ukraine is far from over, indicative of decisions made by the players involved. Take the European Union, which announced not only sanctions against Russia, suspending visa and economic talks while threatening targeted sanctions, as well as a broad range of economic measures. It also announced that it was ready to sign the association accord with Ukraine before the elections. What will Russia's reactions be? Well, so far, Russia increasing its troops in Crimea, totaling around 30,000. But what if a major Russian red line was crossed, like Ukraine joining NATO? Will Russia deploy forces further into Ukraine? Stay tuned for those answers and questions in this edition of the debate. In recent days, Russia and the West have been trading barbs as the U.S. and EU have threatened Moscow with economic sanctions over its policies. Russia has brushed off the threats as the two sides remain divided over how to resolve the crisis in Ukraine. Moscow has called these sanctions, which include asset freezes, visa and travel bans, as extremely unconstructive. It's warned that it will respond accordingly if any of the sanctions are imposed. Unless there's a willingness to step back and look at the whole picture, I, I see this going in a very dangerous direction, possibly even leading to a war confrontation between NATO and Russia, which would be horrific. Several countries, including China and India, have been quick to slam the West for such moves. Beijing has called for a political settlement to end the crisis. New Delhi has also backed Russia's policy in Ukraine, saying Moscow has legitimate interests in Crimea, which should be taken into account. Uh, the European Union would very much like to, number one, avoid being drawn into major economic sanctions against Russia, because quite frankly, the Russians have a lot of economic leverage. Frankly, the European banking and financial system is on very weak ground. Ukraine's interim prime minister has condemned those backing a split and called the upcoming referendum unconstitutional, a position shared by the U.S. and the EU. Despite the call, Crimea has pushed forward the vote to March 16. Over the past week, the local government in the key Crimean poor city of Sevastopol has voted in favor of joining Russia. Lawmakers there have expressed support for the referendum and agreed to form a commission to hold a separate vote. Meanwhile, pro-Russia demonstrators have once again taken to the streets of Moscow and Donetsk, an industrial city in eastern Ukraine, in a show of support for Crimea's secession bid. Now, with less than 10 days to the vote, many analysts believe that Crimeans will eventually vote in favor of rejoining Russia. But it still remains to be seen how Western countries will react to the popular vote. You're watching the debate. Let me introduce our guest, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, Richard Weiss, joins us from Washington. Managing editor and columnist from Veterans Today, Jim Dean, joins us from Atlanta. Gentlemen, welcome. Lots of developments, uh, obviously, to keep uh, up to uh, the minute with, uh, practically. And I'm going to start with you, Jim Dean. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction about uh, uh, the EU taking a couple steps. They've announced to join these U.S. sanctions against Russia, suspending visa and economic talks, and also threaten targeted sanctions, as well as a broad range of economic measures. And they've also announced their willingness to sign an association accord with Ukraine before early elections at the end of May. What's your reaction to that? Well, this is pretty much what we uh, expected because we're in what we would call a post-coup situation. Uh, uh, the West has been basically uh, attacking the uh, Soviet uh, former states on their border, trying to put uh, puppet governments in. And of course, they've been burying on under in debt and they're forcing them to come to the West to be able to get bailed out now. So the sanctions are very uh, small. Uh, as you mentioned in the roll-in, uh, Russia buys a lot more from the EU than the EU does. So uh, I don't think we're going to see any major uh, sanctions. A lot of that is just talk for the public. And also, uh, this is all trying to move the story past the situation that we have a, an illegitimate coup here that was funded and backed by foreign uh, countries. Uh, and the Russians and Putin are, have tremendous grounds to say that we, we don't uh, think that the government has any legal right to claim any legal position on anything because they're an illegal government. And at Veterans Today, all our intelligence sources basically say there are uh, a lot of people that uh, deserve to be arrested for murder, terrorism, and the crimes that were committed in trying and putting this puppet government in place. 
Give us some examples of those crimes. Well, we know the uh, right sector uh, uh, just the other day, uh, the acting prime minister has converted them from uh, a street thugs to official military units. And this was strongly opposed by the generals in their defense uh, ministry, uh, whom were summarily uh, fired. So that showed us that the, uh, the right sector, the deal they had with the opposition, is we will roll you into official military units once we take charge. You'll be on the payroll, and then you'll have immunity for some of the nasty things that we're going to be having you do to the opposition. And all of our sources tell us that we're fairly certain that the killings that were done, that we know from the Ashton tape, were done by one group shooting both parties. That was a classic large country intelligence psyops uh, provocation. So it was a, a terrorist attack, a political terrorist attack, and you see uh, no calls from the West to really investigate or even want to know who was really behind it because the West is really who was behind it. Richard Weitz, do you agree? Um, I, I'm not uh, sure what actually happened in, in Kiev and so on. The, the evidence is mixed. Uh, I'm, so the larger questions, though, uh, I think we, we, we want to address are those related to uh, Russian military intervention in Crimea, the EU and NATO response, uh, where do we go from, from where we are now, uh, and in that context, you would probably have investigations to determine who did what in terms of committing uh, acts of, uh, you know, violating people's human rights, uh, acts of terrorism, foreign involvement, and so on. Uh, but it's not something we're going to be able to solve uh, at present because it's just too recent and the evidence is too mixed and confused. To hurt the ordinary Ukrainians. So the, uh, you know, the Western banks are not going to come in to save them. The Western uh, countries are not going to come in to save them. Just look at what happened to Greece. Ukraine will become a basket case, will become impoverished, and the regular people will suffer. And that's just from uh, the Western uh, side of the equation. As for the Russians, they can retaliate also. Uh, they've been selling uh, natural gas to the Ukraine at a 30% discount. Now they can take that back. Now that will uh, uh, you know, hurt uh, the Ukraine considerably. And uh, they also uh, have been lending the Ukraine a lot of money. So, you know, they can, you know, they have a lot of economic leverage. Okay, so uh, by signing with NATO, uh, they are hurting themselves. All right, well, let's uh, cross over to our Facebook page and, and see what uh, comments some of our viewers have left. The West does not care about Ukrainians. Soon they would be looted out of their wealth and later be dumped to at the mercy of Russia when they are used up. I don't believe US and Russia would bring peace in Ukraine. So it reflects to Ukraine itself how would it bring it? So it reflects to Ukraine itself how would bring it and how to convince its own people. And US and Russia are searching and following their benefits over Ukraine the way that they are coming in. Well, staying in Philadelphia, your take, sir, Mr. Dent, is it all about uh, Russia's interests and also the United interests and United States interests? Are are they genuinely concerned about the uh, situation in the Ukraine? Well, the U.S. Is, is definitely not concerned about the Ukraine because here you you find it supporting uh, neo Nazis and fascists, just as in Syria they're supporting uh, terrorists. So the U.S. has no ideological uh, foundation for this. It's just uh, using this um, situation to harass Russia and also for his own um, uh, financial interests. Uh, uh, what the U.S. really wants to do is to bring uh, gas, uh, natural gas and oil from the Caspian Sea to uh, Europe uh, uh, th uh, through the Ukraine if, if possible. But that's the, for, the, for the long term. And also to use his banks to, uh, to loot the, uh, you know, yet another country. So it has a financial and uh, military objectives in mind. It's not about helping the Ukrainians. It's always talking about freedom and democracy, but the U.S. is never about that because you find it supporting terrorists, uh, 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 you know, in certain uh, situation, and now supporting neo-Nazi, which is, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, highly uh, uh, farcical, considering that Hillary Clinton actually called Putin uh, uh, Hitler when, when the U.S. is actually supporting neo-Nazis. In the system, devalue dollar, hyperinflation, the federal reason, controlled by Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> he can't see you lying.